Zimmerman. Andrew? Hello, good evening, everybody. I'm really grateful that everybody's here to talk about one of my favorite topics, two of my favorite topics, Marx and Engels and the American Civil War. Um, maybe I'll start by just saying a little bit about myself and how I got interested in this topic and then say a little bit about what I imagine us doing this evening um, and, then I'll, and then I'll go into a presentation. Um, I'm a professor of history at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. This year I'm on sabbatical in Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Study, which is where I'm speaking to you from right now. And what I'm doing this sabbatical is writing a book about the American Civil War. And I'm looking at the American Civil War particularly as a not just a, a national war and not even just a national social movement, but an international uh, working class revolution. And I'm especially interested in European American and African American political traditions and the way they played a role in the end of slavery in the United States. Um, my previous work, I've written about German history and about West African history and about US history. And in the course of, um, of, of this project, I produced an edition of Marx and Engels' writings on the American Civil War. If you have your video up, you can see the, uh, the cover of, of the book on the, on the screen um, for international publishers. And so the talk I want to do today is to talk both about Marx and Engels and the Civil War and talk a little bit about the book. I'll be showing a few passages from, from the book and I'll just, I'll be, the, 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 every, everything I quote from Marx and Engels is in the, uh, is directly quoted from, 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 this, from this book. Um, what I want to do today is, is uh, I'll talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then the part I enjoy most, which is hearing questions and comments from, from you all. Um, I'm going to talk about why it's interesting to study Marx and Engels and the Civil War, uh, look at some of the, some of the most important issues uh, that Marx and Engels raised um, in relation to the Civil War, and then think about start a conversation about the lessons of Marx and Engels' writings on the Civil War for politics uh, today. But I hope, I, I hope we can discuss every aspect of it, but especially that last point, I intentionally leave open-ended uh, so that we can all have a discussion about that because I certainly don't have the last answer on anything and certainly not on all the lessons of Marx and Engels in the Civil War for today. So first, let me talk about uh, why, why study Marx and Engels on, why study their, their writings on the Civil War. The Civil War um, was an especially important event for not only in US history, not only in world history, but also in the development of Marx's and Engels' thought. Any kind of thought that is dialectical, and if Marx and Engels, Marxism is one thing, it's dialectical. It's always going to be in a dynamic engagement with its own historical moment, both learning from, but also seeking to transform it. And the Civil War, however, isn't just any historical moment for Marx and Engels, but it's important and it's transformative. And one of the reasons it's transformative is because it brought Marx and Engels out of a, it helped answer questions that were left behind by a political crisis of the 1850s. Um, in the years 1848, 49, there were revolutions in most countries, most states in Europe. And in most of those states, including the German states, Germany wasn't unified yet, but it was separate states, um, there was a significant working class uh, component of the revolution, um, varieties of socialists and communists, including members of the Communist League. That's the organization that Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto for. And when the revolutions were defeated, um, they sent thousands of communists and other revolutionaries into exile. Um, fleeing the firing squad, fleeing, um, fleeing imprisonment. And some people went to Britain, Marx and Engels went to Britain and spent the rest of their lives uh, there. But even more went to the United States where these exiles would fight in the Civil War. A full 10%, that is one in 10 soldiers in the Union Army had been born somewhere in what is today Germany. 
Um, most of these people were not communists or even radicals, but a significant number were, and they brought communist lessons to the Civil War, and they also kept Marx and Engels informed about what was happening, not just what they could have read in mainstream newspapers, but also how a communist leftist thought about the war and the fight against slavery in the United States. Um, Marx and Engels, since the 1848 revolutions, and I'll talk about this in more detail in just a moment, were, they seen, learned from experience that the plans, the, the, the politics, the political economy that they'd worked out in a number of writings, but especially in the Communist Manifesto, hadn't worked. They hadn't brought socialism, they hadn't, they hadn't succeeded. And so they spent the 1850s confused, depressed, you know, a lot of different emotions, but looking for something. And the Civil War, and particularly the revolution against slavery in the Civil War, clarified a lot for them, gave us uh, Capital, which was published in 1867, and so really thought about during the Civil War. The First International, which is the first international uh, organization of socialists and communists, um, founded in 1864. And Marx and Engels were quite explicit that these were draw not only drawing on lessons from the Civil War, but that the Civil War and the struggle against slavery, particularly within the Civil War, were important, extremely important for, um, for their, their new formulations. Now, Marx and Engels never wrote a book on the Civil War, which is maybe surprising because they thought it was so important, but they did write a lot on the Civil War. They wrote a lot of letters to each other. They wrote a lot of articles in newspapers. They made some comments on it um, in other published writings. And with all of these unpublished writings, uh, editors, I'm just the most recent, have been able to assemble a kind of unwritten book by Marx and Engels on the Civil War, which again, as I said, it's not just interesting because anything they say is interesting, especially about something as important as the Civil War, but because you can see them thinking about what revolution means, thinking about issues like slavery and racism um, and uh, working class politics um, in, uh, in, a very, in a context that they found fascinating that was constantly developing. So the book I'm discussing today, again, I said it's, it's, I published it through international publishers, but it's not the first um, uh, attempt to bring together the scattered writings of Marx and Engels on the Civil War. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois might have been the first one to do that in a 1933 article he published in The Crisis. That's an appendix. I, I put that as an appendix in, um, in, in this edition of, of, of the uh, Marx and Engels on the Civil War. International publishers also did an, ish, an edition in 1937. Um, and so my, and my edition uh, is, a, is a new edition from international publishers. It adds some more writings. It uses um, more, uh, more recent translations of a lot of their works. Um, I cut some repetitive writings in order to make room to add um, some of the writings about slavery that weren't directly about the American Civil War, but significant, and also writings that show not just what they said about the Civil War, but how they incorporated the Civil War into their later theorizing about capitalism in capital, for example, and about working class politics and socialist and communist politics, um, for example, in their writings on the, the Paris Commune. Um, one of the reasons it's, it was fun for me to write about this, and I hope those of you who get a chance to read the book will find it interesting too, is that it's not really a Marxist analysis of the Civil War after the fact, but it's Marx and Engels developing an analysis of the Civil War as their own ideas about capitalism and revolution are developing, and as the Civil War itself is developing. The Civil War in 1861, when it first started, was very different from the middle of the war, from the end of the war, from Reconstruction and after. And I'll talk about all of that later, but that's just to give a uh, to give a um, to give a, to give a little bit of of a of a preview. So first, let me talk about let's see if I can get this to work um, about uh, the influence of the um, of the American Civil War on Marx. And I realized as I put this slide up that I, I, I neglected to mention just one really important passage that will show you um, just how important the uh, Civil War was for Marx's and Engels' thought. This is, uh, this is a 
image from the from a page in the book. This is in the book. It's the preface to the first volume of Capital, written in 1860 or published in 1867, so two years after the Civil War had ended. And Marx writes in Capital um, something he repeats a lot in other writings too. As in the 18th century, the American War of Independence sounded the alarm bell for the European middle class. So in the 19th century, the American Civil War sounded it for the European working class. So two things that are important about here. One, just the obvious, that Marx thought the Civil War was really important for not just for the United States, but for the working class movement really around the world. Um, he's in Europe, so he's writing about Europe particularly there. But also, um, many people see the Civil War, um, even in some Marxist interpretations, as a as a bourgeois revolution, as the bourgeoisie ending slavery in the United States. And that was not Marx and Engels' interpretation of it. For Marx and Engels, it was, in a complicated way that I'll be talking about, a working class revolution, just as they saw 1776 as the, as the middle class or bourgeois revolution in the United States. And this was a working class, a working class revolution. So now let me go on to... Um, Marx's most uh, famous um, writing on the Civil War. If you know one uh, text by Marx related to the American Civil War, what most people know is a letter that Marx wrote on behalf of the International Workingmen's Association. That's what I've been calling the first international to President Abraham Lincoln, congratulating him, you can see in that first thing, on uh, his reelection in 1864 um, as President of the United States. And um, what he wrote, this is at the end of the letter, I'll just quote um, this uh, passage at the bottom there. That's, for, that's a letter of Marx to Lincoln. The working men of Europe feel sure that as the American War of Independence initiated a new era of ascendancy for the middle class, so the American anti-slavery war will do so for the working classes. Um, that's a sentiment we just saw he would repeat in Capital. They consider it an earnest sign of the epic to come that it fell to the lot of Abraham Lincoln, the single-minded son of the working class, to lead his country through the matchless struggle for the rescue of an enchained race and the reconstruction of a social world. Very inspiring um, writings. And this 1864 was a very big uh, political moment for both Marx and Lincoln. Lincoln, as I said, had just been reelected. Uh, Marx had just founded the first international, um, an organization uh, headquartered in London that was organizing, internationally organizing international working class organizations. And it's, in a sense, you can see it as a diplomatic letter from one um, revolutionary leader, Marx, to someone that Marx is referring to as addressing as an, a fellow revolutionary, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and certainly um, the connection that Marx builds here between himself and Abraham Lincoln and between um, the movement for communism and socialism and working class liberation and Lincoln's leadership in the American Civil War became increasingly important. To this day, I think, um, Lincoln remains a revered figure for many Marxists. And um, just one interesting example, when the Communist Party organized uh, a group of, of soldiers to fight to defend the Spanish Republic against fascism, in the 1930s, they called, as probably many of you know, the unit, the uh, the Lincoln Brigade. And there's a, I put, I found a, a poster there from, from the Lincoln Brigade that I put up there. So at one level, when you first look at it, and what most people probably um, know, if, if you know anything already, is this, this identification of Marx and Lincoln, and Lincoln as a kind of partially um, or revolutionary hero, something like that. And that is indeed an important image of Lincoln. But one of the things that I think is so interesting about really delving into the writings of Marx and Engels on the Civil War is that Marx's understanding of Lincoln um, is much more interesting than that, um, much less, uh, you know, praising. Of course, he wouldn't do anything but praise Lincoln in a letter congratulating him. But there was an important critical left-wing discourse about Lincoln and about the limits of Lincoln's anti-slavery that took place in among the left in America, both the exiled left um, from Europe, the African-American left, um, including individuals like Frederick Douglass, um, and the uh, 
say the the European American left born in the uh, born in born in the United States. Um, so I think one way to um, what I want to do now is to kind of step back a bit and see how how Marx got to the point where he wrote this letter. Um, not because everything leads to this letter, but in a way because this letter covers stuff that's even more interesting um, than than this letter. So let me see if I can. Ah, I will come to that in just a minute. Excuse me. Please excuse the lights. We have an energy-saving device here. Um, so let me step back a little bit and think about how did Marx get to the point where. Um, where he wrote this letter to Lincoln. And to do that, we have to go all the way back, not even to 1848, but to 1847, when Marx and Engels wrote and published the Communist Manifesto for uh, the Communist League. Maybe some of you know that it was called the League of the Just before that, but I'll just call it the Communist League because just to avoid too many names. Um, and what Marx and Engels have been trying to do and what the Communist League leadership had been trying to do in 1847 is to develop a new understanding of revolutionary anti-capitalist politics. The political viewpoint, the major political political um, program of the Communist League before the Communist Manifesto was written by uh, a tailor and an intellectual named Wilhelm Weitling. Um, and he gives a very basic and um, I think a sensible um, program, which is Capitalism is bad because it subordinates workers to bosses, it subordinates the poor to the rich. Workers need to get together and overthrow capitalism and establish a just society. Um, and Marx and Engels and the leadership of the Communist Party thought that that was simplistic, unrealistic, and they developed a more complicated and long range strategy. Um, and there's so much in the Communist Manifesto, and it's, it's not a talk about the manifesto, so I'll just, just to say it very simply, um, for Marx and Engels um, and for the leadership of the Communist League, um, human history develops through economic stages, and each stage is each stage makes the preconditions for the next stage. The implication here is that capitalism is not just something to be hated, not just something that causes misery, not just something that's unjust and undemocratic and unfair, as Weitling and earlier communists had said, but it's also necessary to develop in order to set the stage for socialism. Now, when revolution broke out in Europe in 1848, uh, Marx and Engels and um, wanted to advocate a program based on the manifesto, and that program was to partly side with the bourgeoisie to partly side with capitalists um, in their own program because for them the conditions weren't yet right in Europe for socialism. Um, this led to two problems that forced Marx and Engels and the communist movement broadly to reevaluate the strategy. The first is that workers who were risking their lives, dying on barricades, dying in battle, um, dying in front of firing squads, going to prison, giving everything for a revolution, didn't want to do that to support a bourgeois government. They didn't think it was worth um, shedding blood to help the bourgeoisie gain more power. Um, and certainly I can understand uh, that, that viewpoint. Um, and so that Marx and Engels did not win as many followers as others farther to their left. Um, people like August Willich, um, and, and, and others, um, many of whom ended up fighting in the U.S. Civil War, interestingly. Um, the second problem is that the bourgeoisie in 1848, um, Marx and Engels, if, you, if you've read the manifesto, you'll know, they often imagine the bourgeoisie as a revolutionary class, but the bourgeoisie proved to be pretty counter-revolutionary in 1848. When faced with a choice between um, democratic reforms that included working class participation in politics, for example, they often went against those democratic reforms in order to preserve their own power. So that the working class classes were not subscribing to the Communist Manifesto program in sufficient numbers, and the bourgeoisie also wasn't turning out to be a revolutionary class. 
And just to cite one example, the most prominent example, in Paris in June in 1848, um, a bourgeois government massacred thousands of workers, some during fighting and some by firing squad afterwards, in order to not to defend the revolution, but to defend their own class rule against uh, socialist revolution. So there's a big question, the famous question, what is to be done? Um, and what are, you, what are you gonna do if you're Marx and Engels, if you're any communist in 1848, 49 in Europe? And the first thing you wanna do is live. And so thousands fled into exile. As I said at the beginning, many to, uh, to Britain, where Marx and Engels spent the rest of their life, even more to the United States, where it was easier to make a living, basically easier, to, easier, to, easier to, for them to live. So that's the immediate question. And that immediate question is important because all of those exiles, or many of those exiles that went to the United States are going to become prominent, are, are gonna become soldiers in the Union cause fighting against slavery. And not just, and we'll talk about this in a minute, not just loyal followers of Lincoln and the, um, and the Union cause, but radicals pushing Lincoln to be more radical, radicals pushing Lincoln, pushing the Union army to be anti-slavery, even in years when it was not anti-slavery. Um, so that's the immediate the immediate problem. The second, the other problem though, is figure out how capitalism works, figure out what a working class revolution might be, given that the schema in the manifesto had not produced, um, you know, uh, results that that Marx and Engels or or any um, communists were were happy about. One of the things, one of the, the reasons why the Civil War was so important for Marx and Engels um, is older than even than the 1848 revolutions which is that the struggle by enslaved people against slavery had been an important component of uh, the international working class struggle, um, even before the 19th century, but certainly in the 19th century. If you had to name the most militant, revolutionary, and successful working class movements in the world in the 19th century, um, you would have most of those, most if not all of those movements would be enslaved um, enslaved workers. We can think about the revolution that overthrew French colonialism and slavery in uh, the country that became Haiti at the end of the 18th century and the early 19th century. In the United States, we can think about Nat Turner or Harriet Tubman, who's, uh, who I have an image of there, um, who were incredibly militant and revolutionary workers fighting against their own enslavement. Um, and while there were many important um, movements by European workers or workers of European descent, um, for the most part, the we could say, if we wanna talk about the, the most revolutionary workers, those would be enslaved, enslaved workers. And the labor movement in the 19th century, the European and the European American labor movements in the 19th century recognized this. Um, Marx and Engels, talked about um, in the manifesto even the quote, abolition of bourgeois property and the quote, emancipation of labor. And using this language of abolition and emancipation, um, they, don't, they don't footnote it, but I think they're referring there to the struggle against slavery. Um, many workers referred to their, many, many free workers referred to their conditions as what they called wage slavery in order to point to the unfreedom that they saw existing in their um, in their own life conditions, even though they were formally free. Now, this kind of analogy could and sometimes did lead to minimizing the uh, the suffering of enslaved people, which was always, um, you know, greater than and uh, and and qualitatively different from uh, the suffering and unfreedom of wage workers. But it also was a bridge for solidarity. It was also a way that workers who were of European descent, um, not subjected to anti-black racism, um, could nonetheless imagine their, connect their condition to the condition of enslaved workers um, and learn from enslaved workers and learn from the kinds of revolutionary strategies that enslaved workers um, did carry out. But Marx was also always clear that when he talked about slavery, he wasn't just using it as an analogy for um, the suffering and the unfreedom of all workers. Um, and I wanna emphasize this because some commentators on Marx 
have not allowed this and argued that Marx minimized um, the importance of slavery. And here's just a very, this is an 1847 um, uh, a text called The Poverty of Philosophy, where Marx is talks directly about slavery and emphasizes that when he says slavery, he means in the first place, actual slavery, um, the enslavement of people of African descent and not slavery as a metaphor. So I'll just read the part uh, that's outlined in red there. He says, slavery is an economic category like any other. Needless to say, we are dealing only with direct slavery, with Negro slavery in Suriname, in Brazil, in the southern states of North America. Direct slavery is just as much the pivot of bourgeois industry as machinery, credits, etc. And he goes on. And I think what's important about there is, first of all, as I said, Marx doesn't see slavery as just analogous to all forms of uh, class oppression in capitalism, but as a particular form of class oppression in capitalism. And he also sees it as in capitalism. It's not a pre-capitalist feudal formation. Certainly Marx knows that there were slaves in ancient Rome, um, but when he talks about slaves in Suriname, in Brazil, in the Southern United States, um, he means uh, slavery as a form of capitalist labor. And that's, I think, a very important point, and one that I think is still controversial um, in some Marxist interpretations. But in my own interpretation, of course, I'm glad to discuss that afterwards, um, I think it's clear for Marx, and I think Marx is correct here, that slavery is one of the forms by which capitalists uh, extract value from the labor of others. Um, Even before the Civil War, Marx also recognized the struggle of unfree workers um, in the periphery, uh, outside of Northwestern Europe, outside of the industrial centers of North America, as a kind of vanguard. He didn't use the term vanguard, but I think we could see him using the term vanguard. And let's look at a letter now that Marx wrote to Engels um, on January 11th, 1860. And the first thing, before I even say what Marx said, January 11th, 1860, that's before the Civil War began, that's before Lincoln was even elected president. So this has nothing to do with, um, the, uh, with the secession crisis, nothing to do with the immediate causes of the Civil War, and everything to do with the struggle of enslaved workers in, you'll see, both United States and in, in Russia, which then had a system of, uh, of unfree labor called serfdom. So he writes to Engels, in my view, the most momentous thing happening in the world today is the slave movement. On the one hand in America, started by the death of John Brown, and in Russia on the other. So he's calling the movement by serfs against serfdom and by slaves against slave as, this, as, the, as, the, uh, as the slave movement. Um, it's strange that Marx sees the slave movement as started by the death of John Brown because um, he must have known that slaves themselves were resisting slavery even before John Brown. And we'll talk about that tension in Marx a little bit a little bit later uh, later this, this evening. Um, he says, I've just seen in the Tribune that there's been another slave result in Missouri, which was put down, needless to say, but the signal has now been given. So against the image that Marx and Engels always saw the industrial working class of Northwest Europe as the leaders of the revolution, here Marx is saying to Engels, and Engels write back, writes back immediately afterwards and says, agree, you know, more or less that he agrees. Um, it's not wage workers, it's not industrial workers, it's enslaved agricultural workers in these massive capitalist plantations of the United States South and similar kinds of estates in, in Russia. Um, so now let's turn to this, let me jump ahead to the Civil War um, and make an interesting point that Marx, I think that they, that Marx and Engels makes, make that they understood because of their perspective on the Civil War as a working class struggle, even before the Civil War began, because they understood the struggle of slaves against slavery um, as, in Marx's view, the most momentous thing happening in the world today, they, were, they already understood the Civil War even before the Civil War broke out. And we can see, and I don't want to, I mean, it's, you know, I don't want to exaggerate the extent to which they, they didn't predict things, but they understood the war 
in ways that the union leadership only gradually came to grasp. And one of the reasons was because of their own theoretical understandings, but also they were corresponding back and forth with these exiled revolutionaries, former comrades, some former rivals within the Communist League, and learning about the struggle on the ground, not just from the news, not just from the mainstream newspapers, but from comrades in um, fighting in in the Civil War itself. So one of the a couple of things that they that they realized, Marx and Engels realized before Lincoln realized it. Um, and the first was that um, the Civil War was a war to overthrow slavery. Um, the Confederacy, when, when it formed and when it started the war in 1861, insisted that it was doing so to defend slavery. Um, and that's true. It actually wasn't just slavery. It was slavery and racism that the Confederacy started the war to uh, achieve. And that's quite clear. And I think it's worth just emphasizing because there's a lot of neo-Confederate nonsense about it not really being about slavery. And it's quite clear just from, I mean, the Confederate, Confederate leadership themselves made it clear that's what it, was, that's, that, that's what it was about. But what's interesting is that Lincoln and the Republican leadership um, did not claim they weren't fighting to overthrow slavery. They were fighting to save the status quo antebellum, the situation as it was before the war, which included slavery in the states where it already existed, the states of the Confederacy, as well as Missouri and Kentucky and Maryland and Delaware, which were slave states in the Union, that, and Lincoln refused to inter interfere with um, slavery there. Lincoln even uh, dismissed an early popular radical general named John C. Fremont, who I have a picture of there on the, on the screen, um, because Fremont in 1861, in the first year of the war, issued an emancipation proclamation for Missouri. Many of Marx's comrades were fighting in Missouri at the time, um, people like Joseph Weidemeyer is maybe a name people know. He was uh, somebody who, uh, who tried to publish the German ideology, was the publisher of 18th Premier, so an important Marxist um, publisher and also an artillery officer in the Union. But a lot of other radicals that are, that are less well known. And they were infuriated. And some of them even talked about rebelling um, within, within the Union Army. And they, they didn't exactly in the end, but they did demonstrate and, and make, their, make their, their force and anger felt. Um, and Marx wrote in an article for the Vienna, for a Vienna newspaper, um, should the Union government meet with a few more mishaps like those of Bull Run and Ball's Bluff, those were two early battles that the Union lost in, it has given itself the opposition, it's, it's given the opposition its leader in John Fremont. Marx already recognized that the war had to be a war against slavery, that the Union might fail for a while until it did make slavery its object, um, and he recognized Fremont as a potential leader. Of, of that opposition. Um, Marx thought that the Union could not win the war without attacking slavery, and that meant for him that sooner or later the Union would have to attack slavery. And indeed, Lincoln, Marx was, was, was correct about that. Um, Marx paid attention to the political situation. Engels paid special attention to the military uh, situation. He was Engels was a uh, had done military service both in the Prussian army and also fought in the 1848 revolution. He was commanded by someone named August Willich, who was a Civil War officer um, in uh, in uh, coming out of Ohio. Um, and uh, Engels um, Real, what Engels, Engels realized just by studying the situation, by looking at railroad maps, by thinking about his own military knowledge, is he figured out something about Union military strategy that the, um, that the, the a Union itself um, leadership had not figured out, and that, but, but that it soon did. And that was that you know, the Union at first and the Confederacy were obsessed with, this, uh, with, the, with taking each other's capitals. The capital of the United States, which was the Union, was Washington, D.C., of course, and Richmond, Virginia, um, was the capital of the Confederacy. And there was a lot of fighting in the Chesapeake Bay region area about um, between the two capitals over who would take the other's capital. And it did seem sort of logical that if you take the enemy's capital, you would defeat them. Um, but Engels recognized as early as 1862 that, um, that the capitals didn't matter, that sure it would be a big setback if 
if Richmond fell to the Union for the Confederacy or if DC fell to Washington DC, fell to the Confederacy. But he said, it's really a war over the country as a whole and it's really a war about railroads. And it's a war that's going to be won, he said, when um, people, when the, when the Union Army stops focusing so much attention on, the, on, the, on fighting the capitals in the East and starts thinking about controlling the railroads that go across Tennessee, across Georgia, and really across the whole United States, and begins to think about it in terms of controlling transportation, controlling the vast space. And that indeed, for those of you who know about the Civil, you know, about the Civil War military history, that indeed is the plan that, um, that uh, Ulysses S. Grant, especially, and also William T. Sherman, the two greatest Union generals, uh, later picked up on and developed and did win the war with. Um, by moving first down the Mississippi River and then um, and then across uh, across the United States, and um, obviously, well, not obviously, there was no evidence that they ever heard this from from Engels or that Engels directly had any impact on that strategy. But there were a lot of radical German soldiers in their armies in the West that where the strategy developed. And I don't think there's any secret correspondence or anything like that, but it is very significant that. Angles was in touch, the, the, the radical position turned out to be the correct position, not only politically, Marx's sense that the war had to become a revolution against slavery or the Union wouldn't win, um, and militarily, um, Angles' is, in a sense, prediction of, uh, of the, the winning strategy for the Union. Now, Lincoln, at the beginning of the war, as you can see from this, um, excuse me, as you can see from the uh, the quote about John C. Fremont, Lincoln was not a favorite of the um, of the left. Um, he was seen as a as a break on the on the struggle against slavery in the U.S. And this was not only from Marx and Engels, not only from German exile communists, but as I said, from the from the the left. Um, Many, 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 many sectors of the left in, in the United States. But Lincoln does become a kind of revolutionary and for Marx, a, a new kind of revolutionary. Um, as Marx, Marx um, predicted, um, Lincoln did eventually turn against slavery, um, issuing a, uh, a preliminary emancipation, emancipation proclamation in September of 1862, and then of course the official one in 1863, that was very limited. People point about uh, that it didn't end slavery. It ended slavery in places that were still in rebellion against the United States, the part that the United States uh, didn't control in the Confederacy. But it was still a step in the right direction. And Marx understood this as a revolutionary step, but a particular kind of revolutionary step because Lincoln was not Marx recognized a revolution revolutionary. So in this, um, let's look at this at Marx's character characterization of Lincoln. Again, it's for a, a Viennese newspaper. It's in October of 1862, so shortly after the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, before the final one. He writes, "Lincoln is not the product of a po of a popular revolution." This plebeian who worked his way up from stonebreaker to senator in Illinois without an intellectual brilliance, without a particularly outstanding character, without exceptional importance, an average person of goodwill was placed at the top by the interplay of forces of the forces of universal suffrage, unaware of the great issues at stake. The new world, he means the United States, has never achieved a greater triumph than by this demonstration that, given its political and social organization, Ordinary people of goodwill can accomplish feats which only heroes could accomplish in the old world in, in Europe, he means. So Lincoln's a revolutionary, but he's a special kind of historical, but he's, a, he's not an intentional revolutionary. He's a special, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's an ordinary person, an extraordinarily ordinary person in a sense in, in Lincoln's, in, in, in Marx's um, understanding. An ordinary person so different from the image of Lincoln we have today. It's, it's astonishing that someone um, that, and, it, and it's, it Marx is not unique in this, to not see Lincoln as, um, to under recognize Lincoln's eloquence. Um, I think many, if not most people would, um, would recognize Lincoln as one of the great uh, American rhetoricians of, the, of, of, any, of any period. Um, 
But for Marx, he's a he's a simple he's a simple person, and he's just expressing historical forces. He's very different. I have the picture of the the Lincoln. Um, the statue in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. from 1920. And that's certainly not the Lincoln that Marx described. And that is an impressive, um, uh, 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 noble figure almost. And from Marx, Lincoln is almost a, almost a comical figure. And that wasn't, Marx wasn't the only one who, who thought that way. Um, but, um, but it's certainly how Marx gets to the idea of Lincoln as a revolutionary, the Lincoln that Marx then wrote to in 1864 in the letter we began with. Now, let's look at what Marx, we talked about what Marx and Engels did get right, and it was a lot, but let's talk about what they missed in Civil War interpretation, interpretations of the Civil War, and how later, later Marxists um, have corrected that. So for Marx and Engels, the Civil War was a working class revolution, um, but who were the workers for Marx and Engels? Um, they tended to focus, they recognized revolution of enslaved people as important, but there were limits to the way they could recognize that. And I think that has to do with their European American back, uh, their European um, background, um, with stereotypes that were common even among European leftists at the time. Less so among the European exiles in the United States because they were fighting side by side with formerly enslaved people. And they had a much different, under, they had a much, a much, a much better, more accurate understanding of, of the politics of enslaved people. But Marx and Engels were writing from London, um, and there were some limitations. They tended to focus on white workers. They tended to focus on Union soldiers, um, even in the period before African Americans were permitted to enlist. Um, they even thought Lincoln, and they even thought Andrew Johnson were kind of working class or related to the working class um, leaders. When Marx talked about um, the revolution of enslaved people. Well, let's look at one example. This is a letter he wrote to his uncle. This is this is again from the from the book um, in May of 1861. So less than a month after the war began, and he said, and I, I underlined it um, there. In the long run, the North will be victorious, since if the need arises, it has a last card up its sleeve in the shape in the shape of a slave revolution. Um, so for Marx, he recognized slave revolution was important, but I think the rhetoric is significant that he sees slave revolution as a card that the North would play rather than something that enslaved people themselves would play. Um, and that's a, that's a limitation of Marx's, of Marx's view, but it's, and I think probably the most important Marxist interpretation of the Civil War since Marx really addressed this directly. And that was an interpretation by the African-American activist, historian, intellectual, um, W.E.B. Du Bois in his book, um, Black Reconstruction. It grew out of his own reading of Marx's writings on the Civil War, the, the, the article that he wrote in The Crisis that I talked about earlier that's included in the, uh, in the edition of Marx and Engels on the Civil War, but he really developed it in, in Black Reconstruction. And whenever people ask me, what's the best book on the Civil War? I always tell them Black Reconstruction because I think it really is the best book on on the Civil War to this day, even though it's you know you might say it's from it's from 1937, so it's it's an old book, but it's still very important. Um, and what Du Bois argued was that it was primarily enslaved Black workers that brought about the end of slavery in the United States. He describes what they did as a general strike. That's his that's his terminology. And what he means by that is that when the war began. Enslaved people often withdrew their labor from plantations. They often fled to Union lines. Eventually, after 1863, um, they began fighting in the Union Army. And that meant for, and for Du Bois, that's what overthrew slavery in the United States. He, he, he says they, they forced emancipation on a reluctant um, Union leadership. Um, he then argues that the um that there was after the civil war there was what he calls a counter-revolution of property that undid a lot of this and restored capitalism and white supremacy um after reconstruction and but for du bois um he really and he really gets and really works out this idea of a working class revolution whose principal agents were enslaved people and i think for me as i read about the civil war too 
that's 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 the that's the account that that I and other historians too are trying are trying to build on. So I want to conclude by just getting us started on thinking about the lessons of the Civil War for uh, communist politics, radical politics, left politics. Um, we can think of it as a lot of ways. First of all, um, you know, for people on the left, they're sort of the Civil War is one of the like the good wars, and I think there's uh, there's uh, a danger of using the Civil War to valorize war, to say war is can be can be a war of liberation, and I think for Marx and even more for Du Bois, what we can see is that there was a revolution inside the war, and that the war itself is not to be applauded, um, but it's the revolution that was made possible by the war, the revolution of enslaved people that was made possible by the war, that was really important. And Marx, in a book on the Paris Commune, one of the great working class revolutions, really of all times, but certainly of the 19th century, um, in which he, he he saw the Paris Commune as modeled, in a way, on the Civil War, he has this wonderful line, which I completely agree on. The, uh, the line is, the war of the enslaved against their enslavers, the only justifiable war in history. Um, so that's that's one, an understanding of revolution as a distinct form of violence that's not identical to war um, and that can be at least partly separated from war. Um, I think we see the Civil War as a successful working class revolution that was undone in part by a counter-revolution of property. Um, and I think that's that's from Du Bois more than more than Marx, though I think Marx would have agreed there's a lot in Marx's writings that supports what Du Bois says. Um, I think it's important for Marx and, and for, for Du Bois and for Marxist interpretations to see that the Civil War as a revolution against slavery was not carried out by elected politicians, by leaders, um, but carried out by working people themselves, um, that there wasn't some elected official that that liberated workers, but workers liberated themselves. And I think working class self-emancipation um, was an important component of the struggle against slavery and an important component of, of Marxism. And I think finally, just one thing I would say is that when we interpret, we, we offer, Mar we think about Marxist interpretations of the Civil War, um, what I think, um, we should recognize is that the Civil War is not part of our past. Obviously, it's no longer the 1860s in that really narrow sense. It's not part of our past. But if we understand the Civil War as a struggle against racism, against a struggle against unfreedom, um, for example, the unfreedom of mass incarceration in our society and many others, we think of it as a struggle for working class power. Um, that's a war that we're still fighting. And I think for that reason, I think we can really see the Civil War and Marx and Engels, not only as things from the past, things from our history, but also as part of our present and maybe even uh, part of our future also. So I'm gonna stop there and I, I'm very excited to hear your comments or your questions or your thoughts. Um, and so I'll turn it over, over to you now. Okay, this is D, D Miles, um, and we are looking for um, those of you who would like to introduce comments or questions. And if you would like to do so, just click the hand, click your raised hand icon, click the picture of the hand, and we'll be able to uh, scroll through and open up your mic. Mike, uh, I'm sorry, Robert, your mic is open, Robert Rossi. That was great, thank you. I really appreciate appreciated the presentation. Uh, there's a letter in 1862 from in the book from Engels to Marx referring to Stonewall Jackson as, I think he says, the best chap in America. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you could talk about how he gets past that and I'm also wondering if there was any commentary from Marx and Engels on Lincoln and the federal government's relationship to Native Americans while the Civil War was underway. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a few more uh, 
questions and or comments? Jim, Peter, if you'd like to introduce a question or comment, you must now click your mic. Jim, Peter, your mic on our end is open. Okay. Anthony Matheson, your yes, mic. Yes, no I'm right here. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman, that's an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Uh, if you're familiar with two books, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852, 12 Years a Slave, 1863. Uh, I can't touch your credentials as someone with a doctorate degree at a major university, but I was a junior college adjunct history instructor for five years with a master's degree in history. And I'm actually published in 12 Years a Slave. Uh, the author of 12 Years to Slave 2013 book in the acknowledgement sections because I've done several things. It's quite a passion with me, this book, this story of Solomon Northup. And uh, my question, Dr. Zimmerman, is how do these two books, if at all, connect with your presentation of the bigger picture of your presentation tonight? Thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. Thank you. Okay, would you like to begin responding? And yeah, we'll take sure. more questions and comments later. Great. All right. Well, first of all, Robert and Anthony, thank you for your for really great questions. I'm really glad um, you asked them. Um, first of all, yeah, Robert, I mean, the Angles, Angles was never, never had any sympathy for slaveholders. I mean, that's, you know, just to state the very, but Angles did have a lot of respect for military expertise. And like a lot of foreign observers, he thought that the South had the best generals. And, you know, I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't even know how that could be, how we could judge that. But in any case, that was a common, a common view at the time. Angles, um, therefore, thought that he was sometimes pessimistic that if the North wasn't, didn't carry out a revolution against slavery very soon, um, that it would lose. Angles was always more pessimistic than, than Marx about that. So that's really what, um, what Marx, um, that, 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 that's what's behind that, um, that, that comment. Engels, you know, he liked to ride horses. He was he kind of a, the, the cavalry um, figure sort of appealed to a kind of romantic streak in him sometimes. Um, and uh, that, I think that's part of it. That's part of it too. Um, but it's mostly the uh, the sense that the, that the southern generals were 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 better were better military thinkers, and that the north therefore better better get revolutionary quickly. Um, and Marx didn't agree with Angle. That's one of the things they didn't agree with on with each other in the Civil War. Um, the Native American question is super important. And I'm glad I'm glad you asked that. Um, before and during the war, Marx talked about free soil, as it was called, as a hope for the working class. And what he meant, I mean, and that's really a very big weakness in Marx's analysis there. By the working class there, he only means white male workers. Um, free soil was the division of land stolen from Native Americans to white settlers. So it didn't include um, black workers, whether enslaved or not. Um, and it didn't include obviously Native American workers either. But after the war, as Marx and Engels thought about, like, why did the war not lead to greater black freedom than it had? And they began to study racism more closely. Um, and they began to recognize that racism was a problem. And I think as a result of that, but in any case, um, they began to refer to westward expansion in the US, not as a making available of free soil to workers, but as a great atrocity against, against Native Americans. But it is something where, where Marx developed in his thinking and Engels developed in his thinking, in part by looking at the, the struggle in the United States. Anthony, thank you for your, for your question and, and hello to a fellow, fellow uh, history teacher too. Um, those are both really important uh, books, Uncle Tom's, Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin and Solomon Northup's 12 Years a Slave. At the time, um, Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin was a really important book in galvanizing anti-slavery sentiment 
Now, a lot of leftists, especially European leftists in the U.S., um, were worried about two things with with Uncle Tom's Cabin. They certainly didn't think they didn't, you know, they, I think they they would have agreed with the portrayal of slavery as brutal, but they also thought that the portrayal was sentimental um, and based on religious objections rather than on political strategy. And so they would have seen it as important but limited in the in in its politics. Now I happen to there's some moments in Uncle Tom's Cabin where I think there's more going on there, but that was what that was what they said. Also, Harriet Beecher Stowe herself um, was uh, very admiring and a very good relationship with English aristocrats who were anti-slavery, but also extremely exploitative. So there was a criticism of, of a kind of anti-slavery that was ethical and restrict and, and still preserved, um, you know, a broader um, a broader acceptance of class of class oppression. So they would have been critical, and I think in some ways fairly, and in some ways not fairly. Um, 12 Years a Slave, I mean, I think that's a great book. Um, and uh, and I think, I don't know that, I mean, it's strange that Marx and Engels didn't comment more on, for example, Frederick Douglass's narrative. If, if I don't know that they commented at all on that. And they wouldn't have known 12 Years, I don't think they knew 12 Years a Slave. But one thing that 12 was so great about 12 Years a Slave is the way Northup portrays the labor process of slavery and the, the deep connection of racism and unfreedom and really vicious violence. I mean, violence that that we're used to thinking about in relation to um, concentration camps, for example. And how all of that is an integral part of capitalism and how capitalism and slavery and, and the violence of slavery um, are so, so connected with each other. So thanks, thanks, Anthony and Robert, for your questions. Okay, we'll take another uh, set of questions or comments. If you'd like to introduce a question or make a comment, please click your raised hand icon and we will open your mic. And I'm scrolling through at this time and I do not see, okay, there we are. Emil, your mic is open. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. This is Emil Skeppers here, your, your neighbor. Oh, from... <laughs> yeah, good to hear from you. Okay. And I'm going to be very eager to read your introduction and, and ed editing of, of the, that key Marx and Engels book. Since others have asked about recent and older books and how this might relate, relate to our Marx and Engels on the issue of the Civil War, etc. Uh, I've recently read two things, two books, one called The Empire of Cotton, yeah. and another one called The Half of It Has Not Been Told. And I'm terrible on names, I forgot the names of both authors, but I would, I wonder if you would be interested in commenting on those two works, that's all. Yeah, great, thank you. Those are there are two, those are two very important um, recent works on slavery and, and political economy. Um, a third one that's, that's often added there too is um, called River of Dark Dreams by Walter Johnson. And those three are very important in really um, establishing that slavery in the United States was um, an integral part of the development of capitalism, uh, not only in the U.S., but especially in the empire of cotton um, in, Euro in Europe as well. I think one thing that um, one, it's not really a criticism, maybe it's a criticism, that, um, histori that many historians have of, 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 these, of these books isn't with what they're arguing, but one of their, one of their they're, they're, they're very much within a kind of academic historiography that saw slavery as not capitalist. And they, there's a much longer literature um, that sees slavery as already part of capitalism. And older literature tends to be a Marxist literature. Um, it tends to be a literature by um, people of African descent and, um, or by people, people from the global south um, that they don't engage with as much as they could. And if they had, their work, it wouldn't take away from how good their work is, but it, but that, that, 
that point about slavery being part of capitalism um, would be um, would see would could, could be they could build on a broader literature. So these are people like Eric Williams, um, who wrote about um, slavery and capitalism, I think, in 1944. I'm forgetting the title, but Eric um, and uh, uh, CLR James, um, who wrote The Black Jacobins about the, the Haitian Revolution, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, and uh, a more recent uh, a Peruvian sociologist named Quijano, Q-U-I-J-A-N-O. And all of them make really important arguments about the intersection of racism, capitalism, and slavery in ways that come from the perspective of a, of a, a let's say, a more, a, a more revolutionary position, a more Marxist position, and a more third world position too. Or, a, or a, and and it's not that that these three books are are not great. They are, um, but they. They come from some. They 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 cut themselves off from a tradition that they might have uh, have um, have dealt with more to their benefit. To their benefit. But I certainly recommend Empire of Cotton and Half Has Not Been Told. They're great books. Okay, let's take one more. Cindy, your mic is open. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. And my question has to do with John Brown. I'm um, I'm very interested in this idea of how your work and your thinking has to do with right now in the movement. Mm -hmm. And who I see right now is our allies on the Catholic left um, as doing, if, if not solitary actions, actions with very small groups of people that are um, symbolic disarming of this nation's militarism um, mm -hmm. for which they are prepared to suffer. And there are some people right now at Kings Bay, Georgia, who hammered on Trident missiles. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if um, Marx and Engels thought much about John Brown, but he, John Brown himself clearly understood that his martyrdom would help to bring about this revolution against slavery. And I'd like to see um, not not necessarily that the that the Communist Party is going to be doing um, very small uh, martyrdom type actions. I'm not asking for that, but I'm just interested in as as our allies, how do we relate to that? Or how did Marx and Engels relate to John Brown? Great, thank you. And I realized, um, should I answer Tim, the question now or should we take, get the question? Let me take one more before, uh, okay. and this will, this will be our last. Okay. There was more hand. Uh, let me see if I can remember. I think it was here. Bill, your mic is open if you'd like to. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for this great uh, discussion. This is uh, one of the best I've attended. Uh, I have two questions for you. One is the CP uh, USA used to have a great um, historian, writer, uh, Herbert Apthecker, and I wonder if you did any uh, reference of his ideas or writings um, in your book. And secondly, um, this uh, theory that um, the North actually was not altruistic in trying to get rid of slavery, but they had to uh, try to find a way the North was losing out on the economy because uh, they, they couldn't compete with uh, free labor in the South. What do you feel about that theory? Thank Great. you. Thank you for both of your, both of your questions. Um, so Cindy, first about John Brown. I mean, I always think John Brown is such a, such an, a, 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 as a, as a martyr, but also as a revolutionary, um, really one of the great American, American heroes. And I, 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 I have, you know, just many leftists have such great admiration for him and Marx and Engels did too. I mean, they saw when, you know, in that, in that letter from 1860, Marx, Marx cites John Brown by name as 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 part of the anti-slave revolution. I think I've been writing about Brown a lot now, and I think um, he's when you look at the strategic world he's part of and the kind of debates that's that are happening, not between say Brown and the people who want to pursue um, less radical strategies against slavery, but among people who wanted to carry out an armed struggle against slavery and thought, and I think correctly, 
that slavery was not going to end without without an armed struggle in the United States. Um, there was an interesting strategic debate about um, about that about about Brown's strategy and about basically a martyrdom strategy um, versus what we call an exodus strategy. And one of the um, one of the debates was between was between precisely that. And it was um, for Brown, as you, as as you as 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 I think you were suggesting, and and correctly, that a strategy of martyrdom um, was a strategy that Brown himself understood as being modeled on a on a Christian sacrifice, and finally on the um, on the uh, you know the martyrdom of, of of Jesus, and that was a very important strategy. And I would say, you know, there's no, it's hard to say. With absolute certainty, but that it worked. That that was one of the most important moments in pushing the country to an armed struggle against slavery. But another model, we could say that's the Jesus model. There's also a Moses model, and Moses was an extremely important political figure for a lot of African American anti-slavery activists. Um, maybe less among free, prominent abolitionists, but among enslaved people themselves. And Harriet Tubman. Um, was often called Moses, and Moses was somebody who, like, as, as the biblical figure, um, created a people, led a people out of out of slavery, um, and led a people uh, into into freedom. And that was another model, and that was a model that um, involved um, not martyrdom, but other kinds of political action too. And I think that it's hard to, I mean, as a historian especially, I, I, one of one of the, the tasks is to try to think ourselves into the heads of, or think ourselves into the situation that people were writing about. And so when I write about that, I always find myself agreeing with the, whatever strategy I'm, I'm writing about at the time. But I think both of those strategies are, are really important and they both, they both, they're not necessarily contradictory and they can both, I think they both have a, they both have a place. Um, and so I think the, you know, the symbolic disarmament, for example, is, extremely important and admirable and inspiring and I think that's one as as was John Brown and I think that's that's one of its one of its great advantages but there's also the Moses Exodus um, organizational strategy too and I think they're you know they're both were available both were important um, Bill thank you for your questions yeah Apthecker is one of one of my one of my heroes he's one of the great um, you know that one of the great early historians that really I mean one of the things that's important I should, I should have mentioned it before, so I'm glad I get to mention it now, is the academic consensus on the American Civil War through the 1950s, maybe even later, was somewhere between conservative and, I mean, could some of it could be racist. There was the there was a historian named William Dunning in at, at Columbia who was sort of the great Civil War historian, and they tended to see the Civil War um, in a number of ways, but none of them were as a struggle for emancipation, um, struggle by enslaved people for emancipation. And it was really, um, I talked about Du Bois, but Apthecker's another one. Um, and there are a number of, uh, of, of CP uh, historians who really were these you know, radical outsiders in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, into the 1970s. And now have really become the, the academic consensus and the academic consensus has, has um, has taken on uh, their viewpoint, and and Aptheker is certainly um, one of the most important there. And of course, he was very close to W. B. Du Bois too. And so, I mean, I think I'm very very much appreciate that you that you mentioned you mentioned this. Um, and yeah, the North, the North. I mean, I would say that you know the the South, the Southern slave economy was incredibly effective for. Um, making rich people richer by oppressing and exploiting workers. And I think, you know, there's often, there's, there's a, some people argue that slavery was doomed um, by its economic inefficiency. Um, but certainly within the period before the Civil War, slavery was getting more profitable, it was expanding, um, and it was an incredibly, I mean, it's it's very brutality. All of the evils of slavery also made it um, very profitable for for slaveholders and very profitable for a whole series of northern capitalists 
who were perhaps weaving slave-grown cotton or European capitalists or selling all kinds of implements to slave plantations. So really, even though slavery was based in the South, it was a U.S. system um, and, uh, and, and plantation agriculture shaped U.S. capitalism and, and, and global capitalism. So I think, I don't know of many, I mean, I think that Northern, Northern capitalist interests would have been in preserving slavery, um, not in ending slavery. And I think, um, and I think really that slavery was ended in the first place by slaves themselves. And, but then that also pushed a lot of allies to, to fight alongside, alongside enslaved people. But um, I think, it's true that one, I mean, one way that North was forced to recognize emancipation is that, as Marx and Engels thought, it would probably have lost, it might have lost had it not won enslaved people as allies in their struggle by associating their victory with, um, with, with freedom. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important conversation. I don't wanna say that's the last word because it's a, it's a really important debate about slavery and capitalism that goes back to the to the books that that Emil was cited, and, and even to the to the to some of Marx and Engels' early writings too. Okay, uh, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to th thank uh, Dr. Zimmerman uh, for uh, joining us tonight. Um, I'd like to extend the invitation uh, when he has uh, time. He might uh, come back and join us in leading a discussion of. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, Black Reconstruction, that would be uh, very uh, uh, nice, uh, very uh, useful uh, exercise. But uh, we'll leave it uh, here for now. And uh, again, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Zimmerman, and I'd like to thank all of the participants who showed up tonight.